nothing worth more You'll ever come close No thinking compare
Good morning, San Marino Community Church. It is such a joy to be seen by you this morning. Thank you for responding to God's call and for joining together as one body of faith in worshiping the living God today. If you are visiting with us this morning, we extend a special welcome to you. We are so grateful that you have taken some time to be here and to share who you are with us and to put yourself in God's way. So thank you. If you are new or if you have visited with us before, um, we invite you to be sure to check out that live chat that's happening somewhere on your screen, depending on what device you're watching on. And just drop us a line. Let us know that you're there. Give us your name. Let us know what you snack you have this morning or what special breakfast you have. I don't know what you want to say, but say something so that we know that you're there so that we can reach out to you. Lindsay Anderson Beck is there to greet you on behalf of the church. She's lovely. You could even ask her how she's doing. She recently had a birthday. She might want to share a few things with you. I don't know, and you don't either until you find out. So be sure to drop a line into that chat while you're here. You might notice that um, we are blessed to have Bo Womack here with us. Willow Stevens is on a much-deserved vacation this week. Um, we are so grateful that you're here, Bo. Thank you. Um, it is a joy to be together. It is a joy to be together to worship the living God who has called us here with a purpose. It's not by accident that we find ourselves here today. And so with that in mind and with a full spirit, I invite you to stand up if you like or stay seated if you like, but however you're postured, open your hearts and open your arms and sing with the loudest voice you can to worship the living God. The church of Christ cannot be bound by walls of wood or stone, where charity and love are found, there can the church be known. True faith will open up that door and step into the street. True service will seek out the poor and ask to wash their feet. is denied to mercy hears the homeless cry and welcomes them inside if while we have we freely share to meet our neighbor's need then we extend the spirit's care through every selfless deed church cannot be bound, cannot be bound by walls of wood or stone, cannot even be bound by distance. God, we believe that by your spirit, you can knit us together as the body of Christ, wherever we are, wherever we're watching from, whatever things we're bringing to this, whatever things we are deriving from it, we believe that you are knitting us together as your church, as your body. 
We pray that you would bless our time together. Bless us all wherever we are. Jesus, in your strong name, amen. If you today are worshiping with someone who's on the younger side and who would like to join Miss Natalie in the Zoom room, then I encourage you to send your uh, student who is up to the age of um, rising sixth grade, really, over to the Zoom room where she will meet Miss Natalie and other students and be able to explore the love of God in ways that are creative and fulfilling and exciting, particularly if you're a kid. Today we're continuing our sermon series, looking at the book of Romans and considering how um, Paul chose to articulate the faith to this new church that was trying to discover what it meant to be someone who believed in Jesus Christ and what it was that Jesus really accomplished in their lives and for eternity. And so the book of Romans has a whole bunch of theological terms in it. It has a lot of um, just really beautifully articulated passages of hope and passages of encouragement. Um, sometimes it can be a little daunting though, because it, it, it can get cloaked in language that doesn't make sense to us or that we might feel like we know, but we don't actually know. And so we're continuing looking in Romans and figuring out what it means to be this church that lives faithfully in response to Jesus. In our passage for today, we're going to be talking about the law and we're going to be talking about faith. And I just want to say something before we really get into the scripture passage. Sometimes as we read the New Testament, we find that the law really gets a bad rap, that there's a lot of times where it seems like the law is being slammed, that the law is bad. Uh, and I just want to say this from the front. The law was not bad. The law is not bad. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. The law was God's first extension of grace to humanity, where God hoped that the law and believe that the law could be a way for humanity to close that gap and to reconcile humanity's relationship with God. So I just want to say, if you're someone who was raised or had heard before that the law was just not all that, um, that's, not, that's not necessarily true. So remember, law was the, the first extension of grace by God to humanity. Also in our passage for today, Paul holds up uh, Abraham as this model of faithfulness that leads to righteousness. So we're going to be talking a little bit about Abraham today. But if you haven't read the story of Abraham, who used to be Abram, then I encourage you to go um, into about the middle of Genesis around, you know, the 20th chapter or so and either side and just, you know, brush up on who Abraham was. It's a great story. Um, it has a lot of ups and downs. And we're going to be talking a lot about Abraham today. So... I think that's probably enough preface. Let's uh, turn to our scripture passage. It's Romans 4 verses 13 through 15. And again, this is Paul talking about Abraham, talking about God's promises to Abraham. And Paul says this, For the promise that Abraham would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, then faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. It's two weeks of wrath, which probably means we better pray. Please join me. God of hope, we hear you now as you beckon for us to respond to you with open hearts in faith. Please speak to us in ways that we can hear. Help us to know who you are calling us to be, particularly if the way that you are calling us to be is not the way that we ever anticipated we would be. 
I pray, God, that you will speak through me, through this sermon, and that you will help all of us to hear, even if I misspeak, to hear the good news of what it means to be claimed as your child. So we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What is it that makes you and me so special to God? Many of us believe that what makes us special is what we do. Our achievements and our accomplishments or our grades or our salaries or our title and reputation. And these things really do make us special in the eyes of the society that we live in. But they are not what makes us special to God. Scripture talks a lot about God's definition of what makes us special. And in our passage for today, the Bible uses Abraham to show us the difference between God's definition of what makes us special and our definitions of what make us special. Because when it comes to the heroes of the faith, Abraham is absolutely special to God. In Judaism, Abraham is the founding father of the relationship between God and the Hebrews. In Islam, Abraham is understood to be one of the links in the chain of prophets that begins with Adam and ends with Muhammad. And in Christianity, Abraham is regularly held up as the prototype of all believers over all time and in every place. If there's one thing that all three monotheistic faiths can agree upon, it's that Abraham is special to God. We know Abraham is special, but Abraham wasn't perfect by any means. He was married to a beautiful woman named Sarah who was unable to have kids and that was seen as something that was shameful in ancient times. Once when the famine drove Abraham and Sarah to Egypt in order to get food, Abraham made Sarah say that she was Abraham's sister rather than his wife, which resulted in the Pharaoh taking Sarah as a concubine. That's not a very heroic thing to do. Years later, Abraham ended up taking on a concubine of his own. Sarah's servant, her name was Hagar with a sole purpose of creating an heir. And then Abraham sent Hagar and the son that he had with her, Ishmael, off into the desert because the jealousy between Sarah and Hagar had become too much for any of them to bear. Because God had told Sarah and Abraham that they would have a son of their own if they would just wait which made Abraham and Sarah laugh and laugh and laugh. But 14 years later, 14 years after he had, Hag had a son with Hagar, Sarah had a son that they named Isaac, which means the one who laughs. And that was the son that Abraham would later try to kill as a sacrifice before God stopped him. And all of this happened after he pawned Sarah off a second time as his sister to yet a whole other king. Friends, Abraham was nowhere near perfect. He didn't always make the right choice. He didn't always do the right things. Sometimes he was selfish. Sometimes he was cynical. Sometimes he was brutal. Other times he took the cowardly way out. So then that leaves us with our question. What makes Abraham so special to us, to God, and to the larger story of faith? Eugene Peterson helps us to answer this important question in the way that he paraphrases our passage for today in Romans 4. He puts it this way. 
So how do we fit what we know about Abraham, our first father in the faith, into this new way of looking at things? If Abraham, by what he did for God, got God to approve him, he could certainly have taken credit for it. But the story that we are given is a God story, not an Abraham story. When we, what we read in scripture is Abraham entered into what God was doing for him. And that was the turning point. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. Put in other words, Abraham was special to God because Abraham chose to take God seriously. When given the choice, Abraham decided to trust God and then to act on that trust, which is just another way of saying that Abraham habitually lived by faith. And living by faith shapes our hearts very differently than living by the law. It's what Jesus in scripture talk about the most, living by faith or living by the law, shaping our hearts. Because the shape of the co and content of our hearts, because who we actually are, no, that matters way more to God than how we appear on the outside. Who we appear to be on the outside is what matters to the society that we live in. Who we are on the inside is what matters to God. And God knows that faith shapes our hearts one way and that the law shapes our hearts another way. One of the most significant ways that faith shapes who we are is in the area of risk taking. Faith creates and confronts risk. Whereas the law eliminates and avoids risk. Faith inspires us to take that leap of faith into this unknown and unseen future. Whereas the law tries to regulate our steps and to dictate where we can go and where we can't go. I want to tell you a story, a true story, about how faith can often create and confront risk. During World War II, London was bombed by German planes for 56 after, out of 57 nights and days. It was what came to be known as the London Blitz. And it was meant by the Germans to break the spirit of the British people. It was leveling factories, government buildings, residences. However, during this terrifying time, the Queen Mother and King George VI refused to leave London. Because of their faith in the British people, because of their commitment to the British military who were fighting against fascism, they remained at their London residence throughout the bombings, often visiting the areas that had been obliterated in the days or the nights before. When bombs would scream through the night and shatter the windows of their own residence, the first thing they would do would, would be to rush and find the people who worked for them and then praise them repeatedly for their contact, saying that they had a magnificent ability to stay wonderfully calm, which sounds about like the most British of compliments that you could ever give. Now, because the queen mother took this risky leap of faith into the unknown and refused to leave the city during the Blitz, thousands of other Londoners refused to leave as well. And their collective resistance and bravery remains a source of pride for the British people still today and is often credited as one of the things that helped them to win the war. This behavior from a whole city of people 
it is then it was then studied several times by sociologists as an example of how living by faith can shape our psyche. Because researchers found that for the Londoners who stayed, who weathered, and who survived the bombings, their survival further cemented their faith that they just might continue to survive. They made it once. They probably can make it again. Faith begat faith. And though their ongoing faith continued to put them in the way of an ongoing risk, their faith set their feet on a path of legend. The Germans had engaged in the Blitz in an effort to crush the spirit of the British people. But the city sustained faith in their leadership and in one another and in what they were doing as part of that war set them apart as special. And it played a significant role in them being able to conquer the evil that was pressing against them. It's something that any British person will be very happy to remind you of if you ever give them the chance by asking. Friends, faith often creates and confronts risk and urges us to take risky steps and leaps of our own. Whereas living by the law seeks to eliminate and avoid risk, faith looks at the unknown potential of what might come and law looks to regulate what might come. Which leads us into the second difference in the way that faith shapes our hearts versus the way that the law shapes our hearts. Which is that prioritizing the law leads us to take an attitude of minimalism. Whereas faith urges us to live lavishly. Paul says in this passage that we're reading today in Romans, he says this, where there is no law, Neither is there violation. Paul here is not promoting lawlessness. Paul doesn't prefer anarchy. It's really quite the opposite. Paul wants the spirit of the law to be fulfilled to the very greatest extent, not whittled away into some sort of simplistic, what can I do? What can't I do? We see this best when we look in the gospels at the person of Jesus who said himself that he didn't come to abolish the law, but that he came to fulfill it. Scripture is full of examples about how this concept of fulfilling the law works and probably is best known in the story that is often referred to as the Good Samaritan. In that story, there's a man, he's lying, dying in the road, having been accosted by robbers. And two men walk by in obedience to the religious law, a law that said that they shouldn't touch blood. And so they don't touch him. They don't stop and help the bloodied man. They walk by without doing anything, doing the very minimum that the law allowed. But then a third man came by. And he acted lavishly. He lifted the man up. He put him on his own donkey. He took the man into town. He paid for his medical care and his room and his board. Whereas the law had established the lowest bar, living by faith urges us to live by the highest of bars. Whereas the law says that it's okay to get away with the minimum. Faith says that we have to live lavishly into the moment that we are presented. Living by faith gives us a glimpse of the highest eternity. Showing us what it means to live with a generous and lavish love. 
I want us to think about what Jesus said during that most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about the lavishness of faith over and over again. He says, if you're slapped on the cheek, then show them the other cheek also. He says, if they ask for your cloak, then make sure to give them your shirt too. He says, it's not enough to just love your friends. You must also love your enemies. Living by faith provokes us to be lavish in the way that we give of ourselves to others. And it provokes us to be generous with our resources. And that lavish Generous faith, my friends, that faith is what sets us apart as special. As special to God and as special to every person that we come into contact with. So, the question for us today is, Where is God asking us to take that risky step of faith? Where is God asking us, asking you, asking me, but also asking us as one united body of faith? Where is God asking us to be lavish in our response to the people around us, particularly to the people who are most in need. Because in that moment where we decide to follow Jesus, we are liberated from the minimums of the law. We are set free from that view that self-consciously tells us that we have to avoid risks and play it safe so that we can preserve the image that impresses the society around us. In that moment where we decide to follow Jesus, we are set free to be lavish and generous and expansive with others unhindered by the limitations of the law that tell us that it might save us, but in saving us keeps us confined and fearful. In that moment where we decide to follow Jesus and take these risky steps of faith, we can begin to understand what God meant when he told Abraham that he would inherit the world. Friends, how are you and me and how are we being called to take these risky, lavish steps of faith? This life of faith, it has always been intended to be an exciting adventure. One that we are invited into, not as a way to earn God's grace, but as a way to respond to God's grace. It's what makes us special. Because when we trust God and when we live in a faith that invites us to be lavish and generous to others, that trust sets us free from trying to earn God's love and sets us free to enjoy and bask in the glow of it. What are you and what are me being called to do to step out in that lavish risky faith. This week, let's do it. As we come to our time of prayer, I invite you to share Because being in a community with one another means that we are able to lift each other up in this prayer. And so we have many ways in order to share. Lindsay Anderson Beck is with us in the chat room and you can drop her a line and let us know how we can pray for you today. 
But of course, there's also the prayer team that you can email and you can let us in the church office know that the deacon prayer team and the pastoral staff are also ways that we would love to have prayer with you. So would you join me in prayer now, corporately? O oh God of Abraham and Sarah, and of us here, now just the same, let us not dismiss your presence, no matter if it's as subtle as the ocean breeze on a summer day, or if it's as clear as a firework display at night. You call us away from a place of comfort in the lowest bar that is the law and into the monumental work that is lavish faith. Keep before us how to be a light in the darkness, love amidst hate, building up where there is tearing down and healing where there is brokenness. God, we are thankful that you don't call us to do it all alone. And that's why we've been given a community. So let us lean in closer to each other, even though we have to be creative because of social distancing. And with the strength from one another, we can do all things. God, we wait until we can have things on our calendar to look forward to that don't involve staring at a computer screen. And we look back and certainly are thankful even more so for the abundance of celebrations and live music and meals with friends and memories with church people that we have been granted up until just a few months ago. And as we look ahead, continuing uncertainly, we realize that we may not go back to the days of old, but that we may take comfort in perhaps the uncertainty we have in Christ, who will yet again reach out a hand to save us. God, let us as a local church, San Marino Community Church, echo the words prayed at the opening worship for the General Assembly this past Friday. We come believing that the divisions of today do not have to be the reality of tomorrow, but in confession and in repentance and moving beyond empty rhetoric and into constant action. We continue as Christ's moving body into this beloved community and to change the world. Amen. Christ be with us, Christ behind us, Christ before us, all around. Christ in busy, noisy cities, Christ where hardly rings a sound. Jesus, you are Lord and Savior. On your love we can depend. Help us see your presence clearly in each stranger and each friend. Oh.
prepare me to be sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for We are so honored that we can continue to be together and live as the church, to live as the body of Christ out in the world, even when we are confronted with bizarre and otherworldly conflicts and experiences. One of the ways that we have been able to continue to be the church together is um, by being online, and you have been so faithful in sustaining the ministry of this church to give. And so we want to first thank you for being faithful financially. And we also want to ask for your continued faithfulness. We um, really rely on you. We've always relied on you, but we rely on you now in particular. And so if you are able to continue to contribute to the ongoing ministry here at San Marino Community Church, We have three ways for you to give by Venmo. You can write a check and send it to the church, or you can go on to our church website and donate directly through our website link. We have a lot of ways that we are continuing to be the church in service to the world beyond just what happens here on a Sunday. We invite you to join us in the Summer of Sustenance. We are collecting food and distributing it to those who are most in need. In whatever way that you are able to pick up shelf-stable items, preferably low sodium, uh, and contribute it, give it to us, we would really prefer, we would be so grateful, and we would love to be able to distribute that to the various institutions that need it the most. Also, through July 20th, we are having a backpack drive giving backpacks to the students who need it in the Pasadena area. All of the backpacks that we give of school supplies are going to Friends Indeed. So if you are able to pick up a backpack and fill it up with school supplies and drop it off, we encourage you to do that anytime through July 20th, and we will make sure that it gets to those families at Friends Indeed. Last but not least, we do have our VBS coming up July 27th through 31st. Um, Our VBS this year is going to be online through Zoom for those who are rising first graders to rising sixth graders. They'll be able to have fun activities where through the internet where they can join their friends, Miss Natalie, Pastor Becca, and other leaders as they engage in a curious exploration of their faith. Um, We ask for you to go ahead and register for that. It's not too late. You are able to register through July 20th. If you have a kid who's younger than a rising first grader, just a reminder that they can be included as well. Uh, We know that Zoom doesn't always work for the youngest of our our friends of faith. So um, just let us know and we'll be sure to send you a pack with all of the stuff that you need for your kids to participate. This week, a friend of mine told me a story about um, a pole vaulter who was struggling to get up and over that bar. And uh, the coach finally said after that pole vaulter had tumbled down time and time again, if when you jump, if when you take that leap, if you lead with your heart, you will make it over that pole every time. I think it's a really good example of how we as Christians are asked to lead with that leap, heart first, and just trusting in faith that we will make the distance we need to make. Friends, I encourage you to join me this week in considering how God is calling us to live lives of lavish faith. We'll know that we're there when we find ourselves confronting risk maybe even creating it. But don't let us fall 
for the minimums of the law. We have great opportunities, friends. Let's pray that God will help us to see them. So we pray in the words of Paul to Timothy, keep your head about you in every situation. Endure hardship. Be the good news to every person you meet and carry that out as your ministry fully. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all of God's people say together, amen. Goes out to the man on the street. Sir, can you help me? It's cold and I know where to sleep. Is there somewhere you can tell me? Oh, think twice. It's just another day for you and me in paradise. Oh, think twice. It's just another day for you and me. You and me in paradise. Walks on and he doesn't look back. He pretends he can't hear her. Starts to whistle as he crosses the street. Seems embarrassed to be there. Being tired. It's just another day for you and me, there and I. Oh, think twice. It's just another day for you and me. Blisters on the soles of her feet. And she can't walk, but she's trying. Oh, think twice. It's just another day for you and me in paradise. Oh, think twice. It's just another day.